I have two questions for you. Um, is that all right? Yeah. Number one, you said that because of the Federal Reserve trying to keep the housing bubble intact, we have these problems today. What exactly is the correlation between the Federal Reserve's actions and the current e economic crisis? What's the connection? Uh, can you rephrase that? What is the connection between the Federal um, Reserve trying to keep the housing bu bu bubble intact and the current crisis that we're in? Anybody? No? Well, um, it's sort of a following up. Um, what the Federal Reserve has been doing is trying to keep the, in the economy inflated to, you know, through the Treasury and through the Federal Reserve actions to what mainstream economists would be say is maintaining aggregate demand in the economy by spending more money and providing more money uh, for the banking system so that the banks feel like they have uh, plenty of money on their balance sheet. Um, you know, printing money and spending money is what basically got the economy into trouble in the first place. So the idea that borrowing more money and spending more money can get you out of the crisis uh, just doesn't make any logical sense. What Austrians view is that you have to allow economy to go into a corrective phase, where instead of maintaining prices up, you allow prices to fall. Now, that means wage rates are going to fall, that means housing prices are going to fall, and the prices of most goods and services are going to fall. But what happens in a corrective phase of deflation is that capital prices fall a great deal. Stock prices fall, land prices fall, uh, real estate prices fall tremendously. Labor doesn't fall quite as much. And consumer goods don't fall quite as much. People are still going to buy gasoline, they're still going to buy milk, they're st still going to buy food and so forth. So if you look at that situation, capital prices have fallen dramatically, labor prices have fallen, but consumer goods are still up there. Now, what would you do in that type of an economy? Anybody? Make consumer goods, exactly. You put, you buy the capital cheap, you buy the labor cheap, you put them together and make consumer goods. Um, so Mises has an example of the business cycle where he talks about a master builder. And so this master builder is planning a house and he has uh, a certain amount of materials to build the house. And um, but when the Federal Reserve prints a lot of money and uh, lowers the interest rate, it essentially makes producers feel like they have a lot more to work with, a lot more stuff uh, to produce with. And so for the master builder, it's sort of like him thinking that he has a lot more housing materials to build with than he actually does. It makes him think he has all, the, all these bricks that he didn't really have and all, the, all this concrete that he doesn't really have. And so what the master builder does is that he starts making plans for a house that he doesn't have the materials to finish. So he, in, you know, uh, on his blueprint, instead of making uh, a, a, a rectangle of a certain size, he makes that size bigger. And then he starts committing resources to a house that size. Now, if, if you lay the groundwork for a house that you can't finish, and then you start laying bricks for that, but you, you can't even get to the roof of the house because you don't actually have the materials to finish a house like that, eventually you start to realize you, you don't have enough materials to build that house. So then what you have to do is you have to break down what you already built up. You have all these bricks in this huge rectangle, but you can't finish the house at that size. So you have to break down what you've already built. You've got to break down the partial walls and then start uh, a more modest pro project. And so in a boom and a bust, uh, the bust is 
when you start to realize that you have to break things down. You have to liquidate. You have to fire people. You have to um, to s start your project uh, on a more realistic level, and that that's painful, uh, but it's necessary. So people often talk about the boom and the bust, and they talk about the bust as a bad thing, but actually the bust is a good thing because the bust is where things are getting corrected. And what uh, to, to your question, what the Federal Reserve is doing is it's making it so that the market can't correct. It's keeping the house builder, the master builder, thinking that he's richer than he is. So it's making him continue to build ambitious houses that he doesn't have the materials to build. And so right now, even though the economy feels, uh, it feels to us that the economy is bad, we're, we still might actually be in a bubble. Even the conditions as they are now, we still might be malinvesting, investing in the wrong things because the Federal Reserve keeps pumping out money that keeps making uh, producers think that they can uh, create ambitious projects that they can't actually finish. Question? My name is Jason Parker. I'm from Huntsville. My question is for Mr. McCaffrey. Uh, do property rights, copyrights, and similar conventions, do those count as socialization in the economy? And if so, can they either be privatized or discarded completely? Yeah, the, uh, the, the question is about patents and copyrights and whether or not they sort of qualify as socialization. Uh, to some extent, this is a controversial uh, topic. I am personally of the opinion, uh, and I think uh, probably uh, the majority of uh, Austrian economists and libertarians at this point are, are in agreement that uh, patents and copyrights are really not uh, justifiable, um, or at least not in the current form in which they exist. So uh, in a sense, you could consider them um, not as socialization per se, but certainly as a, a part of the, the process, certainly as a tool of, of government intervention, um, and particularly as a way of eliminating competition. So in that sense, uh, yes, they, they are part of uh, the socialist, uh, 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 they are part of a socialization process in the sense that they uh, seek to eliminate competition. Um, there is, some people have suggested various ways in which they might exist uh, on a free market, but uh, uh, as I said, there, there's some controversy here and it's, uh, it's not a, a completely settled issue, but for all intents and purposes, uh, Yes, I mean, I think we consider uh, patents and copyrights to be uh, an economic uh, bad as opposed to an economic good. No. Um, this question is sort of for anyone. When the housing bubble did burst, or even when it was building up, you said it hit sort of the entire westernized world that when that happened, were there any places that were able to predict or avoid it in any way, and what did they do? Yeah, the question is about the worldwide housing bubble, because indeed the housing bubble or housing bubbles um, have taken place in many, many countries around the world, and we've seen financial collapses in places as, as different as Spain and, and Iceland and Ireland. Um, Greece is not mu as much of a housing bubble situation, but it's a general financial contagion that continues to this day. Um, I've just been researching the economy of Norway, which is going through a massive uh, housing bubble in terms of their, the prices of housing in that country rising. And so ours was the first housing bubble and the first to collapse, uh, but housing bubbles have spread throughout the world um, based on central bank expansion um, and they've continued to go beyond our own housing bubble um, and to affect many places uh, as diverse as Iceland and China. 
given that we exist right now there's an international division of labor and specialization so we there's a world market so it's very difficult to run and hide from you know the actions of any one central bank or any you know one economy we're all integrated now i mean so probably the only place where the housing bubble really didn't hit was north korea you know given that it's completely sealed off from the world economy right but then north korea has been giving up the advantages of the international division of labor so you know so yeah i mean it's it's a worldwide more or less worldwide uh, phenomenon questions can you talk a little bit about uh what has been going on in argentina since the 1980s just i mean that's i know that's a big story but just in terms of lessons that you guys have been able to, to take from that that you could share how how people dealt with that hyperinflation yeah the question is about argentina uh fortunately our expert on argentina could not be with us today. He's uh, he's actually given a keynote address at the Austrian Scholars Conference of Canada. Um, so I don't know. Is anybody up on the? I'm not an expert, but there's a uh, what I what you can learn is the you know the problem with high levels of debt, and that's the biggest lesson to, I think to learn from some of the experiences in Argentina. And in fact, uh, two. Uh, prominent economists, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, uh, they've written a book called This Time is Different. And it's basically a historical analysis of all you know, instances of currency crashes and hyperinflations, et cetera. They find that every time there is a debt crisis, most governments have historically tended to try to inflate that debt away. And that is probably the biggest lesson to learn from some of the experiences in uh, other Latin American countries as well, that the, the perils of building up unsustainable levels of government debt and how that can basically you know, lead to governments choosing to print too much money and then the cycles of hyperinflation and uh, all the social you know, chaos and the breakdown of the division of labor as a result of that. Uh, one of our online students has a question uh, for everybody here. Um, they were asking if they would abolish the Fed, if we would abolish the Fed outright, or if we would take a gradual process. So, Yes. <laughs> that was easy. Um, well, the, the, the Fed is uh, integrated into the overall financial system. A lot of our paper checks, for example, and electronic checks are cleared through the Federal Reserve System. And so it's something that you can't actually shut down, turn off the lights, and lock the door because a lot of things have to go through the Fed and, and that sort of thing. But you can uh, shut down the Federal Reserve's intervention into the financial market simply by not allowing the Fed to become involved in the federal funds market, um, the buying and selling of government bonds and things of that nature, whereby they rig interest rates in the economy. So you can immediately shut down the pernicious effects of the Federal Reserve on day one, and then gradually work the mechanical integration of the Fed into the financial markets in the economy and eliminate it entirely. Another option which has gotten some uh, attention also is the option of allowing co competing currencies. Uh, so, for example, there was a congressional hearing uh, on this topic, uh, I think a few months ago. So, you know, allow competition in currency with the result that basically the best currency will kind of win. And of course, that is not going to be one which is constantly being, you know, inflated. Of course, we'd also like to see a return to the gold standard, that uh, coin-based money based on uh, commodity money. Yeah. So, where would you describe where we are in the existing business cycle with the housing bubble and the, and the um, in inflation? And also, would you say that there is a safe place to, to uh, store wealth? The question, the question is, where, where are we in the existing existence? Yeah, well, the, the thing is, um, so, of course, we've seen 
Uh, we saw the boom for several years and then we saw the crash as well. Um, the difficulty is that because of uh, what the, the Fed is doing in terms of trying to uh, continue to prop prices up and sort of do what it believes is, is sort of salvaging the economy, which is actually making it worse, but because of what they're doing, there hasn't been, uh, it, it's not likely that the crash has gone uh, as far as it possibly could have. So it's, it's not, we're not um, sort of back to the start where we were before the boom. We're sort of somewhere in between. Uh, and a part of that, because of, again, because of, uh, of current Fed policy in response to the crash, is that we may actually be uh, not just at the end of one bubble, but at the beginning of a new one. Um, and so then, of course, we have the problem of trying to figure out exactly where the bubble is, if, if there's a new one forming, um, exactly what it's in. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, I mean, my, my answer would be that we're sort of, uh, we're sort of at a, a middle level between the worst possible crash, which, as, uh, as Danny pointed out, would have been the, actually the best course of action to take uh, and the, the, the peak of the, the boom. So we're sort of somewhere in between and we're also sort of somewhere in between the end of one cycle and probably the beginning of another. So. Probably the best way to think of it is that we've taken a housing bubble and instead of allowing the crash, uh, we've, as a nation, the government has taken on a tremendous amount of debt um, and all kinds of debt. The Fed balance sheet is, you know, filled with debt. And so the one place that we're sure that you probably don't want to store your money is in that kind of bad debt. So um, a couple of years back, the Obama administration supplied supplements to college students trying to get loans by artificially lowering the interest rates. Would that mean that there's a college bubble forming? Yes, they subsidized the uh, student loans, and so students took out more loans, and more students went to college by use of loans. And so the, the ultimate pile of student loans out there in the economy has grown much larger than it otherwise uh, would have been. I mean, you could argue that there's possibilities of a bubble forming there. No doubt about that, yeah. Um, yeah, and I would just say that um, it's important to recognize the differences between two different kinds of bad effects, that there, there are um, bubble effects where the, um, the government creating money um, lowers the interest rates and directs investment into um, channels that are not uh, feasible in the long run. Um, and, and then there are are also effects where the government is is uh, sponsoring a certain kind of uh, productive activity, and so they're um, funneling resources towards that, and and that direction of resources has nothing to do with consumer demand, and you can you can have that even without any kind of a boom bust cycle. You can have that even without um, inflating the money supply. Just um, governments directing resources where um, where consumers aren't de um, demanding goods at the end of that production process. Uh, would anyone like to comment on the currency crisis? I know we've been kind of stepping around it and saying that there's possibly another bubble forming. Um, so in any way, if, if there is a currency crisis, you know, um, how is this going to be in any way different from other crises or bubbles, like a bubble in currencies and, and debt amongst countries? How would this be in some ways different from a debt in housing, or I mean, sorry, a bubble in housing or a bubble in like student loans or something like that? How, how is this a different kind of crisis because instead of being in actual goods, it's now in government financing. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different, I guess, per se, than the current crises that we've had recently, like the dot-com bubble or stuff like that. My exercise in here. You could think of the currency crisis if it does happen, and hopefully it won't, 
uh, as a result of these other bubbles, in the sense that because, as Dr. Thornton mentioned, I mean, the fact that in order to stop the housing bubble from playing out, you have basically taken on huge amounts of government debt. And then what do you do when you have these huge amounts of government debt, which are impossible to pay off? Historically speaking, uh, you know, in historical episodes, most currency crises have been highly, you know, not only, but definitely prominently caused by unsustainable pileups of government debt. And going back to you know, the question about Argentina and Latin America, that's something we can gain from historical experience. So you can think of the currency crisis as, in a sense, the, uh, uh, an unhappy but you know, the worst possible culmination of, for example, the housing bubble. So instead of allowing the liquidation to occur, instead of allowing you know, the, the debt to be liquidated, most importantly, instead of allowing those, all those factors of production which have been kind of sucked into the bubble sector. So, I mean, if you think of the housing sector as a, you know, a mass pump, you know, and kind of all the factors of production have been sucked into that, you need the labor, laborers, but also all the other, you know, goods which are used in producing houses, but could be used to produce other things to, you know, move away from the housing sector and be more rationally allocated. Instead of allowing that, if you have, you know, kind of propped up that those affected parts of the economy and done that by build, you know, going into debt, then if you want to pay off the debt by, you know, basically inflating the currency, then the currency crisis, in a sense, is the culmination of, you know, you're not allowing the normal course, you know, to take place in a, to, to liquidate the bubble. Um, I'd like to also go back to one of the older questions, uh, talking about patents. Um, so there, there's an important um, distinction um, that Mises draws between um, prices and monopoly prices. And the difference between the two is that most of the time when people, when entrepreneurs make production decisions, let's say that an entrepreneur is, um, is producing a certain kind of good and then he decides to uh, pull back on production. Well, most of the time in the market, the reason why an entrepreneur would um, make production go down of certain uh, along a certain line is because the, he thinks that the factors of production that go into that line would be better served in a different line. So in, in either he's always following consumer demand. He's always um, trying to follow the orders of the consumer. Mises uh, characterizes the market economy as consumer sovereignty that the consumer is king. So the entrepreneurs are, are constantly trying to, to follow what the consumers want. And so when they restrict production in one line, it's usually because they think the consumers really want those resources to go in a different line. But with monopoly prices, which are almost always because of government intervention, what happens is that because of, um, because of a certain shape of the demand curve, um, entrepreneurs sometimes are able to increase profits by restricting production. And they're restricting production along a certain line not to redirect th uh, th those, those uh, factors into another line to better serve consumers, but just because they can get higher profits that way. And, um, and that is called a monopoly price um, when um, when producers are, for ex for example, able to just um, gain, gain profits by just burning some of their crops um, because of the effect that that has on their profits, that that makes um, their profits go up. And so Mises said that um, any price for a patented good, any price for a patent or a copyright is a monopoly price. That w when you have a patent on something, you, you have such exclusive government-sponsored control over the thing that you're able to uh, increase your profits, not by redirecting resources towards another line that consumers want more, but just by restricting, uh, by, by restricting your production on the thing you have a patent over just for the sake of, uh, of profits. And, um, and so that, that, that would be why pat patents uh, are, don't help consumers. Yeah, sort of a more general lesson um, that you could draw from 
Austrian economics in the seminar is that if you look around the economy and you look around at where things are expensive and getting more expensive and other areas of the economy where things are cheaper and getting even cheaper, uh, what you find is that if you look at the high price stuff that's getting more and more expensive, like healthcare, college education, price of oil, what you find is pervasive government involvement in those businesses with things like patents and copyrights and licensing and so on and so forth. And then when you go to other areas of the economy, like cell phones, computers, things of that nature, well, those are cheaper. They're, get, they're, they're cheap and they're getting cheaper and they're getting better. My first cell phone I bought in 1989, it cost like $900. And it came in a big bag. It weighed like 18 pounds. And it was 30 cents a minute to make a call. And this huge battery, like the size of much, it was about the size of an iPad, it would hold a charge for like an hour and a half. Things have gotten better. Um, the discussion of uh, centralized money and centralized uh, centralized monetary control can be seen historically as an answer to the problems that were created by the decentralized system you had before that. How do you decentralize again while avoiding those problems? Yeah, so uh, as far as the, the origins of uh, centralized control of money and so on are concerned, um, it, it's actually, it's really not the case that uh, before we had institutions like modern central banks, uh, that banking was an entirely free industry and that, that a free market in banking created crises and things like that. Um, that that's actually... A, 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 uh, it's an error that a lot of economists make. Um, uh, but if we go back and examine the history, you find out that prior to uh, the formal institutions like central banks like we have today, uh, there was very often uh, government manipulation uh, of the supply of money um, uh, and banking, uh, which actually caused uh, the historical uh, crises, uh, which are sometimes attributed uh, to the free market. Um, there's a, uh, Austrians have done a, a pretty uh, large amount of research uh, on the, the various different uh, panics and depressions that occurred historically and, and have shown uh, pretty convincingly that um, they were in fact caused by uh, early forms of government ma manipulation of the money supply rather than uh, competitive banking. Um, so to, to answer the second part of the question, uh, there, uh, the drawbacks of central banking uh, simply don't exist uh, under competitive banking. So a return to some sort of competitive system uh, would not entail uh, any um, the invitation of any uh, serious economic problems. No. I mean, your your question is is very com it's, it has a complicated and complex answer. Uh, but yeah, just to uh, add to what Matt said, it for example, just if you take American banking history uh, before the central banking, you know, you had for just uh, as one example of a certain, uh, restriction on banking, banks could not, you know, branch, you know, have branch banking, uh, plus they, in some case, in so, at some times they had to hold government debt as part of their reserves. So, you know, in a sense, they were kind of using government debt to kind of, you know, pyramid off that to kind of print money off that. Uh, or could expand their loans based on the amount of government that they held. So it's there are there are many you know details and there's a lot of scholarship out there on these questions. Yeah, but I mean it's it's hard to give a short and ready answer to that because it is a very complicated uh, you know it, it requires a lot of subtle uh, it's a subtle you know problem. Yeah, I'd like to talk about wh uh, why competition helps um, and why competition um, makes it harder for banks to inflate and create these problems we've been talking about this whole time. Um, so when um, with a bank, let's say that there is a guy who um, is holding gold for people. So people have gold and that's the money and, um, and he's holding it for them. 
And so sometimes when people want to get their gold and they want to spend it on something, they'll come to the guy and they'll ask him for their gold. And so he gives them their gold. Um, but some, sometimes they think, you know, that's not really convenient. And so instead, the guy, the, the banker, creates a money ticket uh, for the amount of gold that they gave him. Uh, and they, it creates a paper ticket, and that ticket is worth a certain amount of gold, of the guy's gold. And so instead of coming to the guy, getting the gold, taking it to the, the store, and using the gold to spend it, he just takes his ticket that's good for that certain amount of gold and gives the ticket to the store to buy stuff. Okay? And so before you know it, people aren't even really using, their, their, uh, using gold directly. They're just uh, using tickets to buy things. And that's what, that's what paper currency uh, originally was, is just these tickets. But then the, the banker guy, he gets this idea. He thinks, wait a minute. People are, they, they don't come to collect their, their physical gold all the time. They're, they're just using these tickets. They don't know how much gold I have in, in the vault. Um, why don't I just um, print up a whole bunch of tickets, even for more gold than I have? And people will accept that as, as real gold. And I can make myself richer just by creating all these, all these tickets. And as long as all the ticket holders don't come asking for gold at the same time, I'll be fine. Nobody will find out that I'm kind of defrauding all these people. But the thing is, is that banking is a competitive industry. So now imagine there's another bank in town and, and that banker, yeah, Mark, <laughs> I, I've been defrauding people and Mark um, knows that I've been doing that. And so then he gets a whole bunch of those tickets and he comes he, he, he wants to put me out of business so that he can get more business for himself. So he has an incentive to come to get a whole bunch of tickets and try to, uh, try to get all the gold from me all at once. I don't have all the gold. And so I say, sorry, I don't have all the gold. And people realize what I've been doing. And then they don't have any trust in, in me as a banker anymore. And so that's the way banks competing with each other uh, help to re reduce the amount of extra tickets that are being produced uh, reduces the amount of extra money that's being created. Um, but, but what happens with the government is that they, they monopolize uh, um, banking so that they, they eliminate this competition so that the, the bankers are free to inflate as much as they want uh, without competition. We're out of time. I'd like to thank you for joining us here today and for joining us online. It's been a great pleasure. I'd like you to uh, help me uh, thank the uh, sponsored donor of this event and the faculty.